kind of magical thing. But yeah, anyway. yeah. But this is something that that is already known to the women, the gatherers, for you know a million years. Of course, they know the magic of seeds. What they don't want is the anti-magic of surplus and scarcity. This is what the hunter-gatherer society is constantly struggling against, that there should be no surplus and therefore no scarcity. And in the eyes of all agricultural societies, this has made the hunter-gatherers look miserable. You know, ooh, how can they live without a surplus? You know, what do they do if the game dies out or something mm -hmm. like that? Well, modern anthropologists like Marshall Salins have proven that hunter-gatherers, I mean, his, he coined the term the original leisure society, that on the average, pig, your pygmies, your bushmen, your Eskimos, which are now living on the margins of the habitable world, so imagine what it would, would have been like for, let's say, the Manhattan Indians, uh, are working an average of four hours a day to feed themselves, and, and the rest of their life is they, spent dancing and all right, uh, so making they didn't, art. So know? it's only the, the people who are, who are dependent on crops that tra project this kind of fear to the previous society. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Marshall Salins showed that the larder of your average hunter-gatherer tribe is about 200 items, whereas the larder of your slash-and-burn agriculturists is about 20 items, and that they are much, much more susceptible to let's say crop blight that would wipe them out as a people than your hunter gatherers are because they if if they're if they're no reindeer they can eat grubs you know whereas the agriculturalists have forgotten how to eat grubs so but is there i mean this is a a nice theoretical structure but is there like empiric evidence that uh Aren't there some hunter-gatherer societies like the remnants of them now that are or that were miserable don't we have records of them who who happen to be living in the poorest uh, places? I would say it depends on your definition of misery, but I mean starving, and, or subject to uh, natural calamities. Also, we're are we not still subject to natural calamities? I mean, we just well, heard about world, uh, we just heard about uh, from from Georgia to a, yeah, I know, but Georgia the, we're to Massachusetts, they couldn't take six inches of snow. Yeah, but we're living <laughs> in perversion. We're living in perversion, right? And I think if you if you study um, Eskimos and pygmies and Bushmen, have you ever read the forest? Yeah, they've people stabilized. Like you mean, well, the ones that survived now have stabilized, obviously. For yeah, thousands and they're of years. also highly specialized compared to. So the, some of the, all right. So, but but uh, we we won't solve that problem now. But I would say the answer to your question is generally no. You know that there is no evidence of star of of misery. The evidence of misery is in the eye of the beholder. All right. So, but is there evidence then of this, these early calamities in the early agricultural societies? I guess we still have them now. We have a de uh, look at what we the, have desert. And, look what the uh, Green Revolution did to, to right. North, northern Africa and, we India have, and uh, the Sahel. Drought, drought in the uh, yeah. in Africa. Right. Agriculture. Yeah, but now you have but, India, which is a net exporter of food. And you have people starving all over the place. Yeah, but that's it's because it's all fucked up, uh, right? It's obvious it's now a, that we've it's got the, the technology. Of scarcity that we're talking yeah, about. it's we've the, got the technology of now At to the make root... agriculture uh, a, a, a complete benefit to man. There's no reason why anyone should starve on this planet. There never was, uh, in my oh. opinion. The whole the whole economy of scarcity is is your, what I call the Babylonian con. It's it's the invention of priests and kings. You say you say but, all right. You say if you go back to animal, an animal model, there were uh, whole animal populations get wiped out because they're yeah uh, populations they're, get wiped out. I'm not saying that no Paleolithic population yeah, ever okay. got wiped out. I yeah. would be foolish to say that. But if you look for archaeological evidence of starvation and war and the mass kill offs that begin in the Neolithic, you don't find it. And if you look in anthropology for the uh, uh, for the disasters and and the, and the deaths and the uh, um, uh, poverty and the you know misery, you find it <clears throat> you find it beginning in the in the Neolithic, not in the Paleolithic. You find it beginning with priestcraft, with the class caste division. So this your... was also the beginning of towns and cities, right? Absolutely, and. Uh... What we all know the advantages as we know it. We all we all know the advantages of that, 
uh, supposedly. But what what would you say now that we're doing the critique? What are the disadvantages? We've all been taught to believe that there are advantages. All right. So tell us the disadvantages. I mean, disadvantage, aside only dis from the food, uh, let me ask you. We've a already question. established. What are the advan What are the uh, disadvantages of uh, why do you think living in a in a a, a larger is it uh, the cities are always larger than the than the the tri the tribe uh, By conglomerations are they yeah well, that's why so, it's called city. so like what uh, uh, kind of magnitude are we talking about like were the earliest agricultural settlements a hundred times larger than what the small tribes were no they were only marginally larger I mean the whole mm -hmm. thing takes an immense amount of time because. I mean, to give it uh, scientific nomenclature between your Paleolithic and the Neolithic comes the Mesolithic, which is, you know, several thousand right. years of slow development, right, so. beginning with abstract concepts such as the calendar yeah. and ending with the emergence of, of agriculture as we now understand All it. Right, so very, very long development in between. The idea of right. a revolution is only in retrospect. Right, so I'm just... You know, I've never considered these things, Alex, except I have hints of them here and there. So let me just explore this and play the uh, angel's advocate. No, uh, wasn't the fact that cities, that the population in cities increased, or did it compared to the, uh, you know, then why did it, why did it, uh, uh, wasn't the just let's take that part the fact that the population has increased isn't this a sign of, is this a sign of their uh, in other words is a larger better here why is larger better did anybody okay. ever believe that you know Schumacher well, said small is believe. beautiful I mean that's what we're taught to believe we're taught part. to believe that we're also taught to believe that the life of the hunter-gatherer is nasty brutish and short a very 18th century rationalist view of primitive man then you got the other, the the noble savage view, the romantic view, and yeah. somewhere between these uh, ideological abstractions, we're we're going to find okay. a reality. But can we but can we generalize? We weren't there generalize. some weren't there some agricultural societies that were that would have been better to live in than some uh, hunter gatherer society? What's your definition of a good life? Well. We know what that means. <laughs> I'm not so sure. You right, know, so, I, but, but are I, you going to say I that, feel that every hunter-gatherer... Are you advocating a return to that? No. As I say, I do not. Okay. I'm right, not talking about... Are, are you let, not me finish, let me finish, Tully. I don't talk about a, re a return to the Stone Age. I talk about a return of the Paleolithic. And what I mean by this is, as we reach the end of industrialism, which is in its turn the butt end of the agricultural Neolithic revolution as we now are supposedly approaching a some species of post-industrial life certain things certain aspects of the Stone Age are going to return and the proof of this is it's only been since about 1940 that we've even discovered the old Stone Age and the beautiful pa cave paintings before that we could not have understood them we could have 19th century or 18th century human beings would have looked at the Glasgow paintings and seen nothing but meaningless daubs. So that right? now in the 20th century, suddenly we have this, this, the heart to once again understand the old Stone Age. Why is this? Is this just an accident? No, it's not an accident. It's a sign of an approaching change in the entire economic uh, infra, super and substructure of human life and especially on the psychic level because the psychic comes first the thought comes before the action and what is happening now is the thought of shamanism the thought of an egalitarian band the thought of um, of a spirituality without organized religion and without a priestcraft the thought of a society without kings without rulers without police all these thoughts have been returning since about the middle of the nineteenth century and now that we're at the end of the 20th century, these thoughts are widespread. These thoughts are in everybody's mind. The old Stone Age returns. It's not a question of bombing yourself back to the Stone Age, as they used to talk about yeah, in the I was 60s. Yeah, going to just bring that up. No, this is not what I'm talking about. It I don't want to. I don't want to see an apocalypse. It? I don't want to see. I'm personally, I'm not interested in no. apocalypse and Armageddon. You know, I find them boring and unpleasant concepts. Or what? barbaric, like uh, barbaric. Yeah. So then, to jump ahead, how will, how all this this is, is occurring as a result of a technological revolution now, right? 
Well, yeah, you could say so. I mean, yeah, the fact. relationship between spirit and technology is a complex interplay. It's not a one-to-one relationship. I mean, relation. now people can work at home, relation. you know, to take a crude, simple example. Ten minutes. Whereas they always had to uh, be in a more central place mm -hmm. uh, at one time. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that part of your... Is that part of your uh, it's a sign. perspective? It's a sign and a, and a, well, is it a, a cause path? and an effect. Is it no, a path to follow? Well, the end of the industrial age, there's no need for industrialists to need all these people to work. So it's also almost in the sense. Well, uh, let the, me. Uh, the, I, end, the I, end of industrialism puts the kibosh in the whole Babylonian con of scarcity. Well, of I have a question about that. It reveals the bad underpinning and the false underpinning that we've been laboring under ever since Babylon. The idea that there's scarcity and that only priests and kings can save us from scarcity. Right. Okay, I've... I've uh, this idea is finally crumbling. All right, I want to I want to discuss that a little because uh, everyone says the, uh, industrial a the industrial age is passing, the age of manufacture. But I wonder how much of that is... Uh, as I look around in this room, and I, even in your house, I bet you have a. Uh, do you have a TV? Nope. You have a telephone. Though. Yeah, I've got a telephone. All right, and you do use automobiles. And in other words, when we look in this house or any uh, average house, not, <laughs> not like one of this from this freak here, we see an awful a fucking lot of things. These things are made somewhere all the time by someone who at least presses a button. Mm-hmm. In other words, manufacturing hasn't decreased. Oh, no. It's just decreased in the U.S. No, no, no. and been Need shipped out. It's been shipped it. out, but it's no. But a lot of the the more, I don't. Is it as complete as that, or or have the uh, like the? No, I'll uh, tell you something. The clothing factories moved to Mexico, where we don't see the the exactly. clothing workers. Exactly. I know what you're getting at. It isn't that the economy of production has vanished, and that we now have an economy of information, as some people yeah, like to claim. Right. This is bullshit. This is fascist bullshit. Even there's no, there is, in, in fact, there is no economy of information. Um, however, there, this, this is not to say that there hasn't been a change in the in the economic uh, um, reality that, that that connects production and consumption. That there, there's a very interesting wedge which has been driven ever since about the 18th or 19th century, and it's or called commodity. It? Called the commodity. Yeah, well, that, you know what I mean. And well, we all know what you mean. But that's the, been a, a, a terrible uh, it's change. The, exactly. It's the it's it's the um, psychic totalitarian rule of the commodity which is beginning to slip. It's not production or manufacture which uh, is irrelevant. It's beginning to slip in America. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's very interesting to note that uh, the advertising industry is in a panic, total panic, because of certain technologies which have made it possible for people to avoid advertisements. Oh, on, right. The, the on television, for uh, example. Turn off of the, uh, yeah, all right. That's get rid of advertising. This is a but total... people are stitch, still pursuing uh, the possession of things. Of course. But everything is, you know, on the psychic level, everything is weird, everything is up in the air, everything is in question. You don't have uh, even the certainty of the 1950s, which you and I can remember, right. that the commodity was God. Right. Because our children are going to have less, uh, a, a, a worse life, in quotes. That that means a life with, without as many things as we had. Yeah, the inf if, if there's an information economy, it means an, an, an increase of discomfort. Well, they can't afford for they, people it's like put, you know, it's put the way, it's people put like that us. they can't afford it. But it might also mean, for instance, that they couldn't have a, a kind of uh, ru a sizable hab habitation that they would have to live. Well, that it's the same people old would have to live more crowded. It's the same old Babylonian con, you know. There's there's not so many people in the world that everyone couldn't have a comfortable space and enough to eat. Oh no! I know this is Even practical. Even Buckminster Fuller I mean, proved no, that. No, I know this is. I I know that. That's why I've been a a, a socialist with a small s my entire life. But um, I'm a communist anarchist by now, if you want to be more specific. But uh, uh, still, we see things like uh, starvation on the African continent. We see. Uh, uh, the technology of healthcare there, but not available to a lot of people. We see uh, scarcity, unemployment. Scarcity. That is, uh, we see people who aren't given the uh, means or, or aren't given the things that could easily be produced because of uh, 
The crisis in capitalism, crises in capitalism. And that crisis has been going on since the Neolithic, that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Capitalism as we know it, uh, or too late capitalism, as I like to call what we've got now, is uh, right. an exacerbated development of the Neolithic okay, Revolution. So, so, so how much called. time have we got left? Four minutes. All right, now, since we've sort of skipped the entire historical periods we were discussing, <laughs> I want to jump ahead. We'll get back to them maybe in the next show. Uh, what are your, you now you presented us with this uh, horror, sort of semi-horror scenario. What's the way out? The way out of... of got three minutes. <laughs> well, Nietzsche began talking about the um, excessive, the abund excessive abundance of reality, as opposed to what he saw as a, a philosophical um, falsehood, that scarcity was, was somehow... Um, more real than abundance. He, he said, if you if you look for the ev evidence of scarcity, you don't find it. What you find instead is an is an evidence of continual, unbelievable, excessive abundance. And uh, you meant material abundance. Yeah, yeah, material mm -hmm. okay. abundance or abundance of every sort, psychic mm -hmm. and material. Mm -hmm. Now, Georges Bataille picked up this idea and talked about uh, an economy of excess. And uh, he analyzed certain societies from the point of view of an economy of success, uh, uh, the most notable being the potlatch economies of the northwestern American Indians. Excess, you said where, success. Under. Excess, where the whole economy is based on giving rather mm -hmm. than on commodities. But so also the, destroying. What, uh, yes, right. It's okay. what Marcel Mauss, the great French anthropologist, called the economy of the mm -hmm. gift, le don, the gift. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way out is through uh, this is it through, through an understanding of of this. But that's like a, a magic. You presented a magic proposition. How yeah. do we go? That's right. It is. How do we go from uh, it an is economy somewhere. of greed, where everyone wants as much as they can get, to one this way is, everyone I suppose wants what to give? Drove, uh, this is what drove to give Nietzsche and Bataille crazy. You know. All right. So uh, it's, uh, it's a words, dangerous path. You just path. redefine the problem. You haven't. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, Peter, That's but I don't answer. know. You, you haven't really. <laughs> if done I had it. an answer, if I had an answer, would we be? <laughs> okay, all right, but you don't think the Marxist path is the right one or no. part of it? What no. about the so-called anarchist path? Mm, Whatever that is, of dubious value. Yeah, but close. Why don't call yourself an anarchist? Well, for want of something. Okay, better. for all want right. of something so better. So it's dubious. The fu our future is dubious. Uh, dubious. Like Dubai, as in Dubai. <laughs> uh, I don't think that anarchism has any uh, panaceas to offer per se. I just think that philosophically, it's more sen it makes more sense. That's all. And as Nietzsche said, there's some causes you wouldn't want to abandon simply okay, because it so would give we, we, your, simply because it would give your enemies too much pleasure. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> so, right. I, I've, all right. So what we we're on the path then, yeah. and we don't know. Uh, when we're going to uh, get there? No, I don't think so, and I don't think that any you know it's it's dubious that that uh, an individual action you know the hero theory of history very dubious. I mean, uh, as a socialist, the dominant, in particular, dominant, must patriarch, understand that, dominant primate theory. Yeah, of we're, we we want a group theory of history, right? Basically. And uh, actually, now is where we should cut off because we can get to Fourier next. Which is okay, so uh, we want a. a we want a better world, and we want right. it now. now. Yeah. We're just a bunch of old 60s <laughs> aging hippies <laughs> yeah. at heart. Yeah, right. we're flower, uh, flower, flower geriatrics. <laughs> <laughs> flower <laughs> geriatrics. <laughs> so we'll be back. We'll next be week. back. We'll be back next you can't week. get away from <laughs> us. <laughs> we're just getting hot here. We'll be here. back next century. Okay.